Mark McLaughlin, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to, to be able to chat with you. As we were discussing in the pre-interview, you know, I, I rarely would ever interview a medical doctor for this podcast, and I don't believe I've ever interviewed a neurosurgeon um, for the podcast, but you really have an interesting background and set of insights and skills that I think will be really useful to the listeners of this podcast. Uh, so I'm excited to have the discussion with you. Today we're going to be focusing on the topic of cognitive dominance and how we can use that in dealing with stress and improving our decision-making capabilities in the workplace as leaders and uh, in, in uh, running and leading teams. As we get started, I just wanted to share Dr. McLaughlin's uh, bio with everybody. Mark is no stranger to fear, a practicing board certified neurosurgeon. He has helmed countless high stakes surgeries in which any miscalculation could mean life or death. But decades performing under immense pressure in the operating room led him to a surprising discovery. The secret to success isn't just conquering fear, it's engaging with it more productively. In his new book, Cognitive Dominance, A Brain Surgeon's Quest to Outthink Fear, uh, Dr. McLaughlin shares a new framework for dealing with fear to think and perform at the top of your game during stressful situations. He combines philosophy, psychology, neuroscience, and his own experiences to provide unique insights to, on how the brain processes fear and how we can change our mindset about this universal condition. Cognitive dominance is a way of thinking, a methodology to get better and better at quickly performing at the limits of your mental and physical capacity under maximum pressure with the highest probability of success. Um, Dr. McLaughlin, um, uh, who first discovered the concept while teaching in military circles, um, says this in his book. Uh, Dr. McLaughlin credits cognitive dominance with helping himself move past the common fear freak out problem that deer in the headlights feeling under pressure that holds us all back from high performance. Um, again, what a, a wonderful opportunity to have this discussion with you today. And, you know, in leadership situations within organizations, it may not be literal life or death, you know, in terms of uh, the person on the, on the operating table, but a lot of people will be impacted by the types of the decisions that, uh, that uh, organizational leaders make. And sometimes it's, it's, employment life or death, you know, these decisions will have um, ramifications for, uh, for jobs and for um, effects on consumers and the health of the environment and, and all of this. So it's, it's important to be able to, to learn to be unflappable amidst the high pressure, the high stakes types of environments that leaders will find themselves in. And so I'm excited to have the discussion with you today. Uh, anything you would like to add by way of background, personal context, anything else before we really dive in? Well, no, I think that was great. Thanks for the, the wonderful introduction. And like you said, I'm, a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't do brain surgery. This isn't the same kind of thing. And I, I agree with you completely. It, there's life and death of friendships. There's life and death of relationships. There's life and death of your position at work. Um, so being able to think better and to understand how your brain works and to sort of retrain it so that it can think more effectively under pressure, I think is useful to everybody. And that's really what I, you know, so why I wrote the book. Um, I was a philosophy major in college and I've always sort of liked to think outside the normal parameters of, of you know, what we're doing. And um, after two, two decades in neurosurgery, I realized that you know neurosurgeons make a lot of really critical, stressful decisions, and I wanted to kind of share with people what I had learned from making all these decisions because I feel that a lot of the decision-making algorithms and processes that you follow in neurosurgery, a lot of the rules and the basic core principles are really they're touchstones of life that we can use for managing you know family issues and business issues and personal issues. So um, I'm delighted to be here and to talk with you, Jonathan. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, as we, as we launch into the discussion today, uh, I thought really we could just start with an overview uh, of your conception of this idea of cognitive dominance. 
Um, I, I shared a quote from your book already, so that framed it a bit, but what more can you tell the audience in terms of what you mean by cognitive dominance and why is it important? Sure. It has, it's sort of a daunting term. You know, you would think it's almost like Darth Vader-ish, you know, we're going to dominate your cognitive thought process. And it's, it's really nothing like that. It's, it's really kind of just mastering your own mind. Um, it's defined by the military as enhanced situational awareness that facilitates rapid and accurate decision-making under stressful conditions with limited decision-making time. And, you know, that's a mouthful, but it, what it really means is becoming more effective when you're stressed out and you have limited information to make a decision. And so when I first heard it, I was, I was giving a talk up at West Point to the cadets and I, I was not familiar with the term. And I thought, wow, that's obviously a, that's a wonderful military term, but it's also neurosurgery. Um, it's what we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if problems aren't, you know, aren't delivered to you completely dissected uh, with, with, you know, the, the algorithm to finish, the, finish them off. You need to think and decide with limited time and, and information. But I th thought more about it and I thought, well, that's, that's parenting, you know, that's, that's you know, being a, a husband or a spouse, that's, being, that's running a business. So all the same, those decisions um, have to be made. And um, typically what I saw as I, was, as I was giving these talks is that, you know, we have an element of fear when we don't have all the information, when we don't have all the answers, and we have to make a move. And, um, and fear, uh, can be an, a vital ingredient in, in succeeding and actually performing better, but it can also be an Achilles heel for people and it can inhibit good performance. So uh, talking about fear, I thought would be an interesting concept and particularly being a, a surgeon and a neurosurgeon, doctors and particularly surgeons don't usually talk about fear, uh, but I can promise you every, every one of them has it. Um, a lot of them suppress it. They wear a mask that says, you know, they don't, they don't experience it. And um, people would like to think that their doctors and their surgeons don't have fear, but they do. And I think getting it out in the open and talking about it and dissecting it uh, is a really good thing. So in the book, what I talk about is something called a gradient of fear. And that involves really examining every aspect of fear. Because I've heard some people say, well, I don't have fear. I get anxious or I get nervous, but I'm not fearful. And that, to me, anxiety is just one level of fear. You know, you can have, you can be mortified, you can be terrified, you can be um, nervous, you can be skeptical, you can be, you know, there's a, a whole variance of different types of fear. To me, I think it's all a certain level of fear. And it happens when we experience something that we don't expect to experience. So that's the trigger. Um, that, that hits our brain and says, wait a minute, something that I thought was going to happen didn't just happen. And, and now I've got to deal with it. Um, whether that's getting a job promotion and thinking, oh my gosh, my life's going to be so much better now that I have a job promotion. And then you realize a couple days later, wait a minute, this is like not what I expected. This is uh, more stressful for me or the person that I'm now reporting to, I don't care for at all. Uh, maybe this wasn't the best move for me. So that's, that's when we start getting anxious, you know, or, you know, when I'm operating and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to see a certain, a certain anatomy and I don't see it. So then that's, again, that's, a, that's an event that happens. It drops into my life and I've got to navigate through it. So that's really how the book starts is it talks about um, how I experience um, something that I didn't expect to experience and how I dealt with it initially very poorly and then began to uh, and then began to kind of sort it out over my career. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that overview. And it's so it's so interesting that you pull in this concept from the military, you apply it into your career as a neurosurgeon, and now you start to see all these uh, implications and applications to other aspects of life. You mentioned being a parent, uh, you know, I think in friendships, it just in, in work with our communities, um, we, we find ourselves in these types of high demand, high stress, high stakes types of environments often, and they, man, you know, they manifest themselves in different ways. And, uh, and people learn to deal with that stress, that anxiety, 
um, in different ways. And in a lot of times in not particularly healthy um, or effective ways. And so learning to train our mind in such a way that we can um, learn to be unflappable in the, in the face of danger, you know, in the face of the, the pressure. Um, I think that's really what leadership is all about because I mean, not, it's not all what, of what leadership is about, but it's an important component because um, leaders and organizations, they have pressure on them from all sides pretty much all the time. And it never goes away. You constantly have that weight on your shoulders. Um, and, you know, you might get little moments of reprieve, but there's always different emergencies and fires to put out and, and critical decisions that need to be made. And you're trying to stay agile and you're trying to stay competitive in the market. And you're trying to do all these things that have implications for tons of people that look to you um, for that leadership and who rely on you for your your competency and your capabilities to, to make sure that the organization is successful. Um, that's a lot, that's a big burden. That's a lot of weight to carry and it can become debilitating to a lot of people. Um, but we can interrupt those negative thought patterns. We can train ourselves to respond to those high tension moments um, and calm our mind and then be able to respond in a productive way. Uh, so what are some of the things that you found to, to help you as a neurosurgeon um, in your practice to be able to respond to those types of situations? Sure. Um, just to, to go back a little bit to what you were talking about, which I completely agree with, is that, you know, there are a lot of gray zones when you're running a business. You know, I run a business too. As a, as a doctor, I've got to, you know, pay the bills and make sure the employees are taken care of and, um, you know, everything is, is, is a finely oiled machine. Um, and yet you're trying to cut costs. So you're, you're trying to cut costs, but you don't want to cut quality, right? And that's a very important thing is sometimes there's some real gray areas. And so one of the other concepts I talk about in the book is that, you know, we're, we're constantly um, toggling between something called cognitive consonance. That's when we're, we're acting in, in the pursuit of all our ideals and we know that our actions are consistent with our ideals. And then we're toggling between something called cognitive dissonance, which is when we have inconsistent thoughts and actions, and they're, con they're concerning to us because they may not completely jibe with some of our ideals. And that, to me, is that that's when you start slipping into this anxiety, this uncomfortableness, and, and when you're slipping slipping down from cognitive consonance to cognitive dissonance, and the the concept of cognitive dominance is sort of an instrument that can help you navigate through those waters. So um, what I do in the book is I talk about um, taking a problem or taking an event that, that doesn't make sense. So I took a page from Jordan Peterson, who I'm a great admirer of. He's written a book called 12 Rules of Life, which is a very good book I highly recommend. And um, he wrote a book before that called Maps of Meaning. Um, and Jordan Peterson talks about um, and, th and this is even back, goes back further to Carl Jung, that we're all on this path from where we are to where we want to be. And when events occur in our life that are consistent with our path to get to where we want to be, we have hope. But when events come that are not consistent, that interfere, that's when we get anxious and we get fearful. So when we have those events, what I propose doing is really dissecting them and analyzing them into a very systematic way. And what you need to do is really literally draw a map, an X and Y map, um, which I call you know, the Cartesian coordinate system. And when you, when you draw that X and Y axis, you can ask yourself a couple things about this event. Uh, one is what are the objective components of the event and what are the subjective components of the event? So when I say objective, that is what are the, what are the universal undeniable facts about the event. What it, if we took this event and we showed it to somebody in Australia or in Alaska or wherever, who, wh what would we all agree upon, okay? Um, and then the subject it is, well, what does it mean to you? So simple example, a glass of water, okay? A nice big tall glass of water. Well, objectively, that glass of water maybe is 500 cc's in volume. It's sitting in a clear container. Uh, it has a temperature of 95 degrees. 
and you know it's potable and clear and we could take it to anybody around the world and they would say that that's exactly true but when you say okay well what's the subjective meaning of that water that's a whole different story i mean if i if i don't have access to clean and potable water that's a very valuable glass of water to me or if i have a glass of water that's right here that i'm sipping i've had water a little while ago it's not as important to me so the first question you need to ask when an event happens that you don't you don't understand it's not consistent with your path is what are the objective and subjective components of it and then what you want to look at is is this something that i know or is it something that's completely unknown to me and then lastly you want to ask yourself is this an obstacle or a tool and by looking at those and really mapping that out you can you can drop it into a cartesian coordinate system if you put the x-axis being the objective and the y-axis being the subjective, the meaning side of things, you can drop a, a, a point on that map. You can, you can map that event onto that Cartesian coordinate system. And if you happen to be in the positive x, which is objectively good, and the subjectively positive, you're in the upper right-hand corner of that quadrant. And I, that, that's what I call flow. That's what Mihai Shi Sintmahai talked about many years ago when you can do no wrong, when everything's going right. And don't let your brain think at that point. Let things happen and just react because your body and your mind are in sync. You're in cognitive consonance and you're functioning very effectively. But there are other times in our lives when something objectively is good and something objectively is good and something subjectively is bad. When I talked about the job promotion, when you start working for somebody who you know you can't work for, objectively you got better pay maybe your higher status but you're not feeling good about it that's that's the lower right hand quadrant and i call that the calm before the storm because something's got to happen before you can get back into the cognitive consonance realm sometimes we get something that hits us that's objectively negative and subjectively negative like we get a diagnosis of cancer or a loved one gets a diagnosis of cancer and well, then we're objectively negative and subjectively negative. That's what I call the all is lost quadrant. That's another quadrant that we need to think about very, very carefully and figure out how we can move ourselves out of that quadrant. And then the, there are other events that happen that are objectively negative, but subjectively positive. So these are, these are events that, you know, that uh, you, you know, athlete has an injury and is unable to compete in the major event that they were training for, let's say. But as a result, they end up maybe finding a new coach and spending more time perfecting their skills, and they come back even better. And those are the events and the experiences in our life that we say, oh my gosh, that was, that was terrible when it happened, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And that's the upper left-hand quadrant, and that's what I call the birthing a new skill set quadrant. And once we birth that new skill set, we move back into the flow quadrant and it's this heroic journey that we have that we have to go through these different quadrants as we learn these events in our lives and as we navigate through them and just by picking them apart we can function more effectively when we make our decisions yeah well thank you it's, it's always helpful i think to have kind of typologies to have ways to um provide framings around these types of concepts. So the quadrant system I think is really useful in that way. It can be a, a really helpful mental exercise. And I think anytime we're dealing with the way our mind works um, and retraining our mind to think differently, to act so that we can act differently, it requires us to interrupt ingrained thought, you know, thought patterns and thought processes. And so these types of tools can be really helpful and initially you might have to go it might be hard work to go through the process of of what you just described and trying to to understand what you're doing and why and and how the different components relate to each other but over time of you know exercising our mind that way we will train or retrain our mind to be able to deal with um, those types of situations uh, more effectively uh, and so it's worth that attention and that effort up front to make sure that we are you know in a better in a better place down the road to, to make better decisions as you mentioned um so so i'm curious then 
uh, in relation to decision making and in, and to leadership uh, more generally. Um, how, how do you find yourself building off of that framework, um, the the quadrant system, and that that kind of mental exercise, that mental tool? How do you find transitioning from that into um, your decision making in real time and your leadership in real time? Sure. Um, well, I, I think I could best address that by by sort of just telling you the story of an experience that I had, you know, as a young surgeon and, and just sort of, it, it, it sort of takes you through the whole arc. Um, so um, early on in my career, in, within the first few months, um, I had a gentleman by the name of Jesus Rodriguez who um, came to my emergency room. He had jumped into a pool and fractured his neck. And I met him in the ER on a hot summer night uh, and he was quadriplegic. Couldn't move his arms and his legs, couldn't feel his arms and his legs. And he had a fractured dislocation at C4-5. The vertebra had actually jumped off and had pushed on his spinal cord. Uh, I took him rapidly to the operating room. I reduced his fracture, put his spine back in alignment and I fused his spine so that the, there was no longer any movement there and took the pressure off of his spinal cord. But wh while I was doing the surgery, you know, I, I knew that his chances for recovery were probably like one in 500 or one in 1,000. But miraculously, a few days later, he started wiggling his fingers and wiggling his toes. And, um, and he actually walked out of the hospital about two weeks after the surgery. And there was a picture of me and Jesus walking out of the hospital together. And um, I received a copy of it on my desk from my, uh, my neurology colleague who wrote, what's this, McLaughlin saves Jesus? And uh, I wrote a note back to him saying, never underestimate the arrogance of a neurosurgeon. But, uh, you know, truth, truth be told, Jesus was a very lucky man. And I was a very lucky uh, young surgeon to take care of him and to, that for him to get better. Um, and I thought, wow, I'm on top of the world here. I just finished my training, eight years of training, seven in Pittsburgh and one at Emory. And I'm on top of the world. And this is what I love doing. I'm a neurosurgeon. And I just saved somebody from being paralyzed. This feels great. Um, and a week or two later, this young boy, Anthony, came into my emergency room. Uh, he had fallen off a school bus and he had cut his face. But his parents were at the bedside and, and they said to me, Dr. McLaughlin, our, our boy is not right. I mean, there's something really wrong. He's, uh, he's sleeping too much. He's acting clumsy. Um, you know, we have a pizza parlor down the street and he's dropping plates and he can't bust tables like he used to. And there's something really wrong with him. So we got a quick MRI scan and it showed that Anthony had a, a brain tumor, a deeply seated right in the back of his brain pressing on his brain stem and um just this really neat kid he had a great smile and a great sense of humor um and you could tell he was uncomfortable but he he had a really magnetic personality and i was immediately attached to him and um i knew i had all the training to take care of him um i had trained at the university of pittsburgh dr leland albright outstanding pediatric neurosurgeon and i knew i could take care of anthony and take that tumor out the next day, I, next day or two, I, I got him ready for surgery and took him to the operating room. I positioned him in the prone position with his head down and positioned him exactly the way I wanted. And I made the incision and I came down and I was literally in flow. You know, I was opening everything up. I opened the bone. I came down on this very angry, bloody tumor and I surrounded it and I took all of its blood supply and then I gutted the tumor, sort of like scooping it out with a little micro instrument under the microscope. And then I surrounded it a little bit more and I shrunk it a little bit more. And I just, I got this devil and I, and I shaved it off of his brainstem and I got this thing out of him. And the operation went perfectly, perfectly. And he woke up neurologically intact. And I walked out of the hospital again that day gone, I feel great, I love this. This is exactly what I was here to do in my life. And, but the next day, Anthony began having some very serious complications. He began to um, shriek every time the nurses tried to examine his arms and his legs, and he stopped talking. 
um, he wasn't himself at all. And I took him back for a scan and the MRI scan showed that the tumor was all gone. Um, and all of his labs were good and everything, but he just wasn't acting right. And he developed a very rare complication called cerebellar mutism, which is this unusual complication where children don't speak and they don't move. And every time you try to move them, they just shriek at the top of their lungs. And, um, you know, I reassured his parents saying that this is, this should settle down. This, this should get better. But it was really one of the worst cases I had seen. And um, a day or two later, you know, he began developing a fluid buildup on the brain. And I had to take him back to the operating room and put a shunt in to bypass the fluid. And then a few days later, his pathology came back, you know, anaplastic tumor, which is, you know, one shade less than malignant, which is bad. It means it's more likely to recur. A few days later, he got um, another complication where the shunt clogged and I had to take him back to the operating room. And this poor boy over the course of three months had every single complication you could imagine, wound infection, wound weakness, leaking wound, needed multiple surgeries. And I just, I just saw this beautiful boy just have one neurological devastating event after another, after another. And I just saw him slipping, slipping through my fingers. And, um, and he suffered, he suffered. And his parents suffered. And I just, it was a really hard thing for me to see in it. And then at the end of the three months, he finally stabilized. And his mom and dad, they said, Dr. McLaughlin, you know, we want to get a picture of you with Anthony. And so I sat at his bedside and I, I held his hand and I, and I faked the smile because I knew there was nothing good coming for this kid. You know, he was going to be off for chemotherapy and radiation. He had had multiple insults to his brain with all these complications. And, you know, he was never, ever going to be the boy that I expected he could be after a perfect operation. And um, I, I just, I, I had this terrible feeling like what, what could I have done better? You know, could I have operated quicker? Could I have relaxed uh, the, the pressure on the brain sooner? Could I have retracted less? Could I have picked up his infection sooner? There was constant questions that I had and I had this terrible feeling that I, you know, I, I heard him. I felt that I, I could have been a better surgeon. I could have, you know, done more. And you know, that's one of the hardest things a surgeon has to experience sometimes is sometimes what we do actually causes suffering in people and we have to live with that. And uh, that was when I was like, wait a minute, this is really, this is not what I wanted to have in my life. Like, this is not what I envisioned as a doctor. You know, I didn't expect to feel like this. I want to, I want to crawl into a rock. I just don't feel, I don't feel right. So I was down in that, I went, went from flow down to that, that quadrant of calm before the storm. You know, objectively, I had all the training and the skills, but subjectively, I felt terrible because I felt like I could have done more for him. And, um, it affected me really severely. I, I, um, I began to take these long walks at night, you know, and I would, you know, I'd have an extra cocktail or I would, you know, I would, ha I chewed tobacco and I would chew tobacco to try and like get, get over it. You know, I had all these poor coping strategies. And so I felt, you know, even though I was around a loving wife, a loving family and, and great partners, I felt really, really alone which I think people feel sometimes when you do everything right and something bad still happens, you know? So I ended up, you know, again, suppressing that stuff. I, uh, I ended up stopping doing pediatric neurosurgery. I, I couldn't bear to have another Anthony. Um, so I, I uh, ended up stopping pediatric neurosurgery and I ultimately moved to New Jersey. And, um, you know, I carried that with me. And every time I looked at that picture on my wall, I felt bad. I felt sad, and I, I didn't feel good about myself. And I, so I, I I carried that for a while, and then fast forward 15 years, and I started writing this book about fear and grief and how to deal with it. And I realized I had to go back and find out what happened to Anthony when I moved to New Jersey. I just sort of figured he probably didn't do well and may probably passed away. So I got on the internet and I got on Facebook and I looked up the pizza parlor that the family had and 
I scrolled into the pictures and sure enough, I saw a picture of this, of his parents. And I scrolled down a little farther and I saw a 24 year old man in a wheelchair with his parents. And I realized, oh my God, Anthony's still alive. I couldn't believe it. I called his parents. I, I called the pizza parlor that day and I said, hey, Mr. and Mrs. McCory, I'm, I'm come, I want to come up and visit you. I need to speak with you. I've been writing this book and I, I thought about you and Anthony for a long time. Can I come visit? And so I drove up that weekend and I saw them and I, you know, I saw Anthony and, you know, Anthony, he's got some neurological deficits, um, but he's still part of his family and he's, and he's still dad's number one guy at the pizza parlor. And um, I, I talked to his family, his mom and dad, and I said, you know, I, I wanted you to know that I, when I left, I always, I always felt bad and I felt like I let you down. I felt like I could have done more to, to save your boy. And they came around the table and they gave him this gigantic hug, you know, and they said, what are you talking about, Dr. McLaughlin? You're our hero. You saved our boy and he's still with us. And we know you did everything you could. And they gave me a, some presents to go home with. They gave me a, a plant from their restaurant that had been there since they started the restaurant. And they gave me an Italian purse that they had got in Italy, Italy for my, my wife, Julie. And they gave me a picture that I had forgotten about. And this was this picture of me with Anthony and the whole family and my family that we had sort of a last dinner there before we moved to New Jersey. And that had been hanging on their wall. And so I, 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 I got in my car and I just looked at myself and I thought, oh my God, like you had this whole thing wrong. You know, you, you thought you, you failed Anthony, but you, you release your gift to Anthony and, and he's, you, you did everything you could and he's still here and you did what you were supposed to. And that feeling was just this incredible feeling of gratitude and my, my understanding of my purpose to, to serve. It's not always to cure. It's to serve, you know, and that was this unbelievable lesson. And then I, I called my co-writer, Sean Coyne. I told him about the whole experience and he said, wow, that's amazing. I think we should put the story of Anthony and the story of Jesus together. And I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense to me, Sean. It's like, you got this triumph and then you still have this story of this boy who didn't do well. And he said, Mark, you, you don't get it, do you? I'm like, no, I, what? He said, Mark, you... You tell a story of Jesus and you take somebody who's paralyzed and you make him walk again and you say it's luck. And then you take a, a young boy who has a terrible tumor and you do everything you can for him and he has complications that are out of your control and you say it's your fault. That's an impossible standard to live up to. Impossible. So that was when I birthed the new skill set and I realized, wow. I've got to be kinder to myself and I've got to not hold myself to that impossible standard. And, you know, on that day, neurosurgery and this, the practice and my training, and I just got a lot better at what I do. And I think a lot of people out there, they have experiences very similar, you know, in, in the same archetype of Anthony. They do something, they do everything they possibly can, something bad happens, and then they hold themselves responsible for this impossible standard. So I would ask your, your listeners today, like, who are your Anthony's? What are the things that you carried with you and told yourself a story that you weren't good enough when you actually really were? And when you realize those, those events, you become a better leader, in my opinion. And, and I became a better leader and a better doctor. And it was going through that whole archetype from flow to calm before the storm to all is lost to birthing a new skill set and moving back into the flow phenomenon. So I wish I had known this when I was experiencing my experience, but thank goodness I know it now and I can share it with you and your listeners. Well, thank you so much for sharing those stories. Um, you know that that takes a great deal of, of vulnerability to be willing to to share that, and I, I think there is a lot we can learn um, from the experiences that you had. And you're absolutely right. We need to learn to be um, forgiving to ourselves, right? And 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 we need to be um, compassionate towards ourselves. And that's not to say that we shouldn't hold ourselves accountable. As leaders, we do make decisions that impact people. 
and if we're negligent in our duties and in our in how we go about making those decisions and it has negative impacts we do need to own up to that and we do need to take responsibility for that just as i'm sure you would as a doctor if you truly were negligent in in the care of a patient but what you shared was not negligence it was simply external factors outside of your control and you know in leadership we deal with that all the time too like there's so many variables there's so many different um, aspects that are influencing our decision making at any given point in time and then there's just so many external factors that we can never possibly control and so what we do is put our best foot forward make the best possible decision we can uh, within the context that we're that we are you know given and then and then we try to learn from it and hopefully make good decisions but then grow from whatever uh, occurs and we need to be we need to be compassionate with ourselves um, and own up to mistakes when they happen but also not um, not just bombard ourselves with the guilt uh, that might come from not being perfect because because frankly none of us will ever be perfect and we're going to make mistakes and it's just the way it is and even if we don't make an actual mistake we do the best we possibly can do under the circumstances as good as anyone could possibly do things still aren't always going to work out the best or the way that we had hoped just like in the story that you shared um, and so if we can remember that then we 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 can help ourselves to not become uh, debilitated by a fear of failure um, and just recognizing that that setbacks failures are just part of the game um, that we play as leaders and you know sometimes you take two steps forward one step back but you learn from that experience and then hopefully next time you're equipped you know to to deal with the difficulties you know that arise in the future right well thank you so much mark for everything you've shared today it's a pleasure it's been a pleasure and i would love to keep talking but i suspect you have other things you need to get on with with your day um, as a as a busy surgeon um, so i i'm going to let you go but before we part ways today i wanted to give you the last word and give you a chance to share with the listeners how they can get connected with you uh, find out more about your book and anything else that you'd like to share sure so again i would just say that cognitive dominance isn't is, it's not like an enlightenment sort of thing i still feel like i'm a student of it it's something that you can continue to work on and uh I have a cognitive dominance assessment that you can access on my website, which can ask you some questions and kind of give you an analysis of where you are and some feedback on where you can improve. That's what my website is markmclaughlinmd.com. And um, there's a lot of the, like the story of Anthony and the, the methodology of thinking uh, about fear and how to navigate off of it is certainly described in the book, Cognitive Dominance, which is available on Amazon. I have a blog uh, that, that uh, focuses on performance, and uh, there are a number of recorded uh, lectures that I've given on performance enhancement in different realms in sports and business and, uh, and in hospital management and, and, and medicine. So I'd be happy to share those with you. They should be on uh, the website, markmcglothonmd.com. Um, and, you know, I would just leave with um, it's... It, I really, it was, it was funny because I, I wanted that term to be the title of the book, Cognitive Dominance, A Brain Surgeon's Quest to Outthink Fear, knowing that that may be scaring people away, but I really thought it was important to bring out this big idea and share it with people uh, and to understand that, um, that these are universal problems. And the, the, the luck I've had, the blessing I've had is that I've been able to kind of learn it in a in a, a a cauldron of or a jungle of decision making uh, difficulties, and so um, I think that the the points are are they're transferable to business and parenting, and I, I hope you enjoy uh, the material in the book or in the in the quiz. Thank you for the time today. I really appreciate it, Jonathan. Thank you again, Mark. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I hope my listeners will uh, reach out to Mark, get connected, find out more about what he might be able to do for you. Uh, check out his book. And I wish everyone a wonderful week. I hope everyone stays healthy and safe and that we can all continue to find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. Thank you.